Mad Fulton, The End of an Error. After more than 550 issues and 67 years, Mad Magazine is coming to an end, and we're talking exclusively with members of the usual gang of idiots. Today, former Mad senior editor Joe Rayola walks us through the last days of Mad. I'm David Levin, and this is Pop Goes the Culture. My next guest is Joe Rayola, who for over 30 years was an editor at Mad Magazine, a writer, a contributor, a a person who definitely uh, contributed to uh, the legacy of Mad Magazine after uh, Al Feldstein left and uh, and, and continuing on through the uh, Meglin Ficara years and into the Ficara years. And uh, Joe, you were a senior editor. There's only there's there's maybe a handful of people who who ever had that title. Is that correct? That is correct, and it is also correct that I am one of the people you can blame <laughs> for keeping me mad going through the end of 2017. In that period, from 1985 through 2017, the post Gaines era, because Bill died, I think, in 1993. And you you knew Bill. Uh, fairly well, especially you know in the last in the last several years of his life, right? That's true, but no one really knew Bill. He was inscrutable. He <laughs> he wouldn't let himself be all that known because he was he was out of his mind. But as much as one could know Bill, I think that I I knew Bill well. We had a we had an interesting relationship. I think I think everybody can say they had an interesting relationship, whether you knew him very well or not known him. Well. I only met him. I would say a handful of times. He sort of knew who I was. He never got my name right, but but he always said hello and was very friendly and cordial and uh, and the kind of person I I look, you grow up hearing about this legendary guy and then you got to work with him for for quite a number of years. I did, I did. Bill and I were very different people. Um, Bill. Well, I'm a vegetarian. Bill was a legendary carnivore. He would eat the animals while they were still walking, if he if he possibly <laughs> could. Um, I'm I'm a physical fitness guy. Bill Bill Definitely was against not. exercise. He was against exercise of any kind except chewing. Um, <laughs> Bill, uh, I would say Bill was the sickest man I've ever met, the unhealthiest man I've ever met, but he was also the happiest man I've ever met. So it was always interested. Uh, I was always interested in connecting and talking and sparring with Bill, although it was impossible to win an argument with him because although he was an atheist, he believed that he himself was God. And to this day, I'd rather pray to Gaines than God myself, but that's just me. Uh, okay, one story that sort, of, that sort of sums up your relationship to Bill Gaines. Oh, well, there, there are several. Okay. But the, the the main one I think would be the the hot dog story. Um, the hot dog story would probably be the one that's most memorable for me. Um, Bill uh, Bill called me into his office one day and he wanted me to. Uh, this one man was on four eighty five Madison Avenue, right? And Bill wanted me to go down to the corner of fifty third Street in Madison and get him a couple of hot dogs from the hot dog guy. You know the sad red guy with the um, um, right. umbrella. And I said to him, look, you don't really want me to get you hot dogs. And he says to me, why? And I said, because I'm a vegetarian and you're a meat eater, but we're both men of principles. You're a man of principle. You stood up to the United States Senate to fight censorship in the 1950s. You stood for your values. You respect other people who stand for their values. Therefore, you know I would be betraying my values to go downstairs and get you a hot dog. You don't want me to get you a hot dog. And Gaines says to me, wrong. (laughs) In fact, as the office vegetarian, you're the only person I can trust to get the hot dogs and not eat them on the way back here. So please go downstairs and get me a hot dog. Part one of the story. This is a real indication, in, uh, a real view into Gaines' mindset because he was like Mr. Spock. You you couldn't win an argument with him, although his logic was somewhat twisted. It was it was uh, it was something inscrutable, right? Yeah, irrefutable. Well, well put. So anyway, I go downstairs. I get Gaines the, the hot dog 
I bring the hot dogs back to Bill. I put them on his desk. I'm walking away. He says, stop. There's one more thing. He says, I want you to get me a, a glass of diet orange soda. Now, in the <laughs> next room, there was a refrigerator with a freezer. And in the freezer, there were Gates had 24 ounce plastic Flintstone cups. And in the Flintstone cups, he had uh, he pour roughly 16 ounces of water. And so there'd be a big frozen ice cube at the bottom of the Flintstone cup. And he would like diet orange soda poured on top of that ice cube. He liked very cold diet orange soda. Very brilliant, anyway. too. Yeah. <laughs> so I say the games, no can do. I draw the line with diet orange soda. I happened to read an article, and this was true, in today's New York Times about the fizz biz, about the soda business. And the article just goes into detail about how soda is no good for you, even diet orange soda. And in fact, this article specifically points out diet orange soda that has a chemical in it that is bad for you. It eats away at your gallbladder. Gain says to me, and I quote, I don't give a fuck. They took my gallbladder out in 1952. Get me the diet orange soda. <laughs> Uh, you know, you tried, Joe. You tried. Gay, you know, like I said, you couldn't win an argument with, with Gaines, and he was very direct. I remember remember when he hired myself and my longtime writing pal, Charlie Cadu. We were in, it, in his office for the first time, and Gaines said to us, he's talking about John and, and Nick, John mm -hmm. Ficarra and Nick Meglin, the editors who wanted to hire us. He says, John and Nick told tell me that you boys are very talented, but I certainly don't believe them. <laughs> I, pr I propose to pay you as little as possible. <laughs> it's exactly what he said. Uh -huh. oh, interesting. Okay, well. He's, just, he's a shrewd negotiator. <laughs> right, right. That's very honest. He, he proposes starts, to pay as little as possible. Starts from a position of strength. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was Bill. And here we are 25 years after he passed away, and and now uh, MAD has come to this place where, well, people are saying it's, it's, it's gone. Now, this, this didn't just happen overnight. Um, and as I recall, and maybe you could walk us through the story, five years ago, I guess it was at this point, DC Comics moved to Burbank, and and from what I understand the story, and maybe you could clarify it for me, uh, they made the editors kind of an offer that they did refuse. Well, the entire company, all of DC, moved from New York City to Burbank. I think in 2014, it's kind of a time warp now. I, I lose track of this, so you're going to have to, you know, I may have that wrong. But it sounds like, I re as I recall, around 2014, the entire company moved. And they wanted the entire MAD staff to move as as well. And they asked each of us individually to relocate to Burbank. Now, the staff did not get together to discuss their offer collectively. It was an individual offer to each of us. And as it turns out, with the exception of one person on, on, on our team, everyone said no. We did not want to go to Burbank because we have lives in New York, family in New York. I don't think that we could conceive or imagine mad in Burbank. Just seemed that it, 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 something about that didn't feel right. In any case, we all said no. And DC moved to Burbank and they said, well, OK, you can stay. <laughs> so, right, well, it was sort of a practical decision because they weren't in a position to keep mad going, probably, uh, with, with if the whole staff was just suddenly gone. Well, that's what happened at the end of 2017. I think when DC was making the entire, when the entire company was making the move, they had a lot on their on their plate at at that time. And you're right. probably right. It was it made more sense for them to to leave Mad behind in New York so they could focus more on all the things that they had to do in making the making the move. Right. So on that level, it probably made made sense for the company as a whole. For us, it was great because now Mad. The mad office was, in a sense, was geographically separated from D D.C. as it was, well, the first years I was working there until 1993 
when MAD became part of DC and we moved from 485 Madison Avenue into the corporate heads, headquarters with DC at 1700 Broadway. It kind of went back to, to, hey, MAD is this satellite working in, independently. We know DC's out there. We were, of course, they were in, in, in touch with us and we had a good working relationship with them, but and, it was and, fun to be separate. And you guys didn't really consider yourself to be a comic book per se. I mean, you know, the, the DC, DC, I guess, or Warner Brothers considered MAD to be kind of a comic book, which it was originally. But you guys at MAD, you thought of it kind of differently, didn't you? We never conceived of MAD as a as a, a comic book. I mean, I mean, I mean. Keep in mind that on the editorial side of of MAD, that would be John Ficarra, Charlie Cadu, and myself. We're all about the same age. We didn't grow up reading the comic book MAD. The comic right. book MAD was a mere twenty three issues that was gone by 1955. Right. We grew up reading the Feldstein Mad, and that to us was really the most powerful and socially uh, impactful Mad, the Mad of Don Martin and Spy vs. Spy and Al Jaffe and Mort, and Mort Drucker, none of whom were involved in the Kurtzman Mad. Right. So we grew up on the Mad of the 19th 60s. None of us were comic book guys. None of us were huge comic book fans. We were comedy writers. We viewed Mad as a comedy magazine, right? And we never saw Mad as a comic book, right? So now, okay, so now DC is out in LA in Burbank, and uh, you guys are now sort of in your own little satellite company at yeah. At, within some other offices, but you had your own sort of wing of the offices. And yeah, now we're still at Warner Brothers. You're still at Warner Brothers, still part of Warner Publications, I guess. Um, DC is still the publisher of MAD at that point, so they're still sort of nominally in control of the Not nominally. We're, we're, one of DC, we're, we're one of the – MAD was one of DC's three – Worlds, DC. Uh, there was DC Comics, Vertigo, Vertigo and, Mad. and Mad. Those, those were the three things that DC did. Okay, so now you're sort of on your own, and you're putting out the magazine. Then it gets cut back to bi-monthly and quarterly, and then back up to I guess bi-monthly again. We were we were at six six times a, a year the last number of years, every other month. Right. So so bring me up to at a certain point they come to you guys and say. All right, and you, 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 my guess is that you all had a sense that something was going to happen at some point. That you, first of all, you know, with 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 uh, the the senior editors and the editor in chief sort of coming towards retirement age, I guess. Anyway, but I, I get there must have been some handwriting on the wall at a certain point where you said, okay, at a certain point, you know, they're going to want to bring you guys to to Burbank. Yes, we all knew that eventually uh, uh, resistance was futile <laughs> and that MAD would be moved to Burbank at some point. We didn't right. know exactly when, but we knew that was coming. We thought it might not be quite as soon as it was, which was in January 2018. We thought we might have another year or two, but it turned out to be January 2018 when the move was actually made. Okay, so how many months did you have, and and what pre preparation did you do? What what was it like during those last several months at at uh, at, at Mad New York? Let's just say. Well, the 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 new Mad editor, Bill Morrison, was announced in June of 2017, and we had already all declined the invitation to go to Burbank by then. I guess we were invited to go to Burbank. Those of us who were invited. In the spring of 2017, right. Although we were invited to go to Burbank without even knowing who the new editor would be, we just knew it wouldn't be one of us, right? Because Bill Morrison had not been announced, and I don't even know if they knew at the, the, the time they were had invited us that Bill Morrison would be the new editor. Mm -hmm. So basically, the ask to us was, please come to Burbank, work on Med, uh, and report to an editor who we haven't hired yet. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Wait, there, there's an offer that you couldn't refuse either. So you, so you, all, so you all collectively or individually said, "No, thank you." Uh, with the exception of a newly hired pr production artist, Bern Mendoza, 
who I think had been with us for about a year. Uh -huh. uh, did he make the yeah, move? The entire, uh, did he did make the move. Yeah, he became the senior person uh, <laughs> uh, on on the new, on on the new team. But you know, Charlie and I had been at Mad at that. We were on thirty third year. John right. Ficarra was in his thirty fifth year. Right. Sam Viviano, as art director, was in his twentieth year and thirty three years as being involved with Mad. Right. Even the junior staff at that point had 15, 20 years of editorial experience with with Mad. Wow, that's that's pretty astonishing. Now, now, all right. So now. You're coming towards the end. You've been there 33 years. John's been there 35 years. Dick DiBartolo has been there since the beginning of time, you know, and he would come to yes. his own little office. I mean, you're coming to the end of, as, as you guys put it, the end of an error. Um, and E-R-R-O-R. Yeah. E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, which is probably what I'm going to title this, uh, these, this series of, of, of episodes. Um, so now you're in a situation where... You know, there's there's no putting off the end. You're going to be in a situation where you're all going to be leaving something that you've been there for for decade. You know, your entire adult life, basically. So, yeah. so what was it like in the offices during those last? You know, you you knew for about a year. What what was that like? Is it it had to be different? All of a sudden, you're in a situation where you're going on and you fall into a routine. This had to be completely different. Yeah, not really. We just kept being funny. <laughs> you know, we, we, we just kept being wise ass and having and having fun. I mean, we knew we knew what we were there to do. We the moment we get there, we'd start making fun of people. Uh, generally, generally, we started making fun of each each other. And then once we got tired of that, we moved on to making fun of people who were well, well known. But it, it basically, that's what we did. And we were very sharply focused during that last year, in the last couple of years, actually, right. very sharply focused on the political satire that we were doing. You know, I, I, I book in mad 65 year run uh, with what I'm going to call the 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 Gaines Kurtzman um, lineage from 1952 through the end of 2017 as follows. Sometime in the, in the 50s, there was a famous quote by Time Magazine, Mad Magazine, a short-lived satirical pulp. <laughs> and at the end of 2017, Rolling Stone called Mad the best political satire magazine in the country. So we left... Mad, we think creatively in pretty good shape. On the business end, that probably wasn't in good shape for a long time because of the decline in print and all that. Right, right. Well, you had a lot of competition in ways that you hadn't had prior, mostly from people who probably grew up on Mad. I would, I would tend to think, you know, the five, yeah, the folks from SNL, the, you know, the 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 Judd Apatows, the uh, you know, those guys all sort of grew up reading Mad Magazine, and suddenly there is not know, a doubt in my mind that the Mad voice is still relevant and is still in the in the culture and will not die anytime soon. But this idea of a printed magazine, people getting their humor from something that they buy on this thing called the newsstand and and open it up and carry it around um th those days clearly are 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 coming to an end they have been for a long time um do you think mad is dead like they're they're shutting down publication but you know I, you know i i i i don't think i think there's still heartbeat there I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, obviously, there's 67 years of re reprinted of, of classic material, although it, it has it has been reprinted an infinite number of times. And I don't know. I'm sure they'll they'll be able to repackage that in interesting ways and get more mileage of it. the The big question is: Will Mad continue to produce any kind of new material? And if yes. Will you be able to find it? Where where will it be? And and those questions, um, the answers to those questions uh, are are still to come. Well, you know, as a, as a 
for reprints, those are more for nostalgia. I mean, the honest truth is that Mad was always about and of whatever time it was being printed. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 you know, humor about Obama or Bush or Nixon doesn't really play well in the world of Trump. And my guess is, my hope is, that Trump, humor about Trump you know, four, five, ten years from now, well, it's just not going to be as relevant or or as funny to the people who would be reading a humor magazine. You know, political satire is of the moment. Or reading uh, My Fair Ad Man is certainly wonderful, uh, but it's still about something that was 40, 50 years old. That's right. At that point, it becomes mostly about nostalgia um, or history. So, Mad Magazine made it up to 50, uh, made it up to 10 issues, the reboot. Uh, that, that took, just Now, walk me through, just for the folks who just don't know the history, Mad rebooted after you got, you know, they, they said, okay, we are going to call an end to the New York era, and now we're going to the Burbank era, so rather than continuing the number, they did what a lot of comic book companies do nowadays they created i guess mad volume two with the reboot um i don't know if they called it volume two or not the mad again i'm going to say from the Gaines kurtzman lineage up through the uh, through the end of 2017 produced 550 regular I issues right and they were numbered two, three, four, five. You want me to keep counting? Yeah, I Six, keep going. Seven. I think we all know how to count. It's all good. And, it, and it, the first 23 issues were a comic book, beginning with number 24. It became a magazine. It was number 24 to 550 as a magazine. Right. With the move to Burbank, the first issue produced by the Burbank team, which came out, I believe, in April of 2018, that right. was Mad Number One. With a whole new logo and a whole new crew. And well, like it, was a it was a comic book kind of logo, and, and it was a mostly an all-new editorial team. But a as lot I of, said, they, they brought back a lot of the writers and, and artists for... for no, I wouldn't say a lot. Some, several. I'd say, I'd say some. Okay. Um, some of Mad's main writers, some of, some, some of the writers I would consider some of Mad's best writers mm -hmm. that were working with the old team did not uh, were not published in the new Mad mm -hmm. at, at all. Um and, uh, you know, this was with a team of uh, editors who themselves had never written for MAD themselves, as opposed to the old team that had five editors who sold to MAD and were published in MAD before they became editors. So they're starting with a team of editors who had never even written for MAD, and that obviously put them in a, in a very difficult place. Yeah, that's, yeah. Like, and and that, that that's understandable that they would be in a in a difficult place. Um, any thoughts about about well, what are you doing now? Uh, what's 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 your life like now that I guess you're retired from that and doing other stuff? I'm glad you, you know. I'm looking for my keys. I'm so glad that you. Uh, <laughs> this has been this has been something that has been holy. I can't I can't find them. You know, and, and I I had them. I thought I had them on a, on a hook. I guess I'm a hook here, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not there, and now just the whole my whole world is is completely turned upside down. The so good news is you have you have you have the time to look for it now in I, a way I that do. you might not have when you had to go to the office every day without your keys. I this is really difficult. I'm 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 losing things, and I've I've got I'm, hair management has become a big thing for me now. You should, got you, hair. Should work, you should work on that because I don't know if you've noticed, Joe, but since yeah. you started working at Mad Magazine, perhaps you haven't been paying much attention. Um, no, no, that's but, not what I mean. I mean, I've got hair <laughs> growing, growing in places where I, I, I want to eliminate it and I, I, need, I need different <laughs> implements to, to try to trim it or, you know, not good. Not, it's not good. This has become, it's taking up a lot, a lot of my, uh, a lot of my time now. Good to know um, that you're still being productive. That life is good. This is this, this stuff is important to me, man. I you know, can't. And uh, a, a man of Italian heritage, of my age, has got to be careful of the of of the hair growth in a, in un in unwanted places. Now it's a it's a big thing in my life. So that's I, basically what I'm doing. 
I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Joe Rayola, uh, senior editor emeritus for Mad Magazine. How's that? You like the word emeritus? I do. It, 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 although it makes me sound like I'm dead, I, I, I kind of no, like. No, that would be it. dead. That would be former, and uh, I think there's a whole other word for that. For I thought that. emeritus meant buried alive. The Isn't late, the late Joe Latin? Rayola, the late Joe yeah. Rayola, late of Mad Magazine. Thanks so much for coming on. I hope you'll come on again, tell some more stories. Uh, but unfortunately, this this time, the story is mad is uh, out of publication, and uh, and we're all kind of sad about that. I'm I am I feel embarrassed to have done this. So you kept it alive, and then you basically drove it into the ground. And that is my legacy. <laughs> Joe, thank you for uh, coming on Pop Goes the Culture today. Thanks, Dave. Hey, it's David Levin. If you like Pop Goes the Culture and want to see more of it, don't forget to subscribe, click on one of these links, and please help us out on Patreon so that we can keep bringing more Pop Goes the Culture episodes to you.